Hi everyone, it's Razi Alkane, and uh, I'm back with a third interview on uh, my channel, and I'm very happy to present to everybody uh, the voice of Sideswipe, Prowl, Duke, Major Blood, most importantly for me, Raziel, and uh, also, um, maybe you don't know this, but he's the uh, Parquet Butter Tub. Introducing Michael Bell. Hey, everybody. So, how are you today, sir? Uh, good, good, cool. I'm, I'm vertical, to all that counts. <laughs> that's a good thing so um yeah i've like i told you the it's uh you know it's uh gonna run for about an hour i sure. just want to welcome a couple friends in the chat uh miguel thank you mc dj chris thanks for showing up adam good to see you robot recruits and i'll add a oh well, there you go, Rodimus Primal. This, so Mr. Bell, Rodimus Primal is the reason I collect Transformers at 40 years old. He opened my eyes to the world of collecting and that it's okay to be a 40 year old man collecting plastic toys. So, as, okay. long, as, not, as long as they're not blow up dolls, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? a wall of blow up dolls. That'd be something interesting. Oh, and he's currently, he does a Transformer retrospective. So basically, he takes a character and he runs every iteration of it. Well, I do the opposite. I take one actor and I do just, you know, what the actor did. So, okay. uh, but uh, Sideswipe retrospective coming up. So that's going to be interesting. Oh, and this is my sister. She's uh, watching from uh, her house with my parents. So, and then I'm just going to tell my mom right now, she's a big Star Trek fan. So... Uh, Mom, Michael is Zorn from the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. He was, well, basically the bad guy, in a sense. It's okay. I cut my hair, you noticed. From <laughs> there you go. And I have a bit of a list of questions. Sure. Um, but uh, just, you know, some uh, stuff, uh, generally speaking. And then after that, stuff more for my personal uh, curiosity. So, And then if we have time, uh, I'll... Uh, check to take questions from the people in the chat so okay um okay just for the people at home that wouldn't have seen my spotlight on you which i'll correct by the way you told me that i made a mistake about the date when you started so on the anniversary of my channel i always redo a video so i'll redo yours just to correct all of that and also you know better editing and everything because i think i've improved since then so good all right, so can you, uh, for the people at home, can you give us a quick resume of your journey into becoming an actor, uh, starting with singing for pennies at your local market? <laughs> yeah, okay, I got that story. I don't remember that. My mom told me that. I'd okay. Come, she turned me to the market to get something. I'd come home with something, the exact amount of money, but I would come home with some change, quite a few pennies. And she finally figured out, she found out that I'd been singing at the market. Um, singing a song in, in my era in the 30s, so 1938, born in 38, so 48, so I figure about 48, about 10 years old, maybe 947, 1947. So I was singing a song called Hots and Rolls, sitting on a brawler, brawler sewer, which means absolutely nothing. It was early, early rap, let's put it that way. Early rap, okay, from the 40s. Yeah, from the 40s, the early, late 30s, early 40s. And, uh, then from there on in, I've always wanted to be an actor. You know, so it, it always rankles me, and it's none of my business. But when I hear people say, well, you know, I want to be an actor or uh, or someone who's quite successful at this point, young person is successful, I just fill into it. Ah, boy, wouldn't it have been nice to, for me to just fall into it? It was yeah. a struggle. I really, I really, like many young actors and older actors in my age category, we really worked at it, really worked hard, trained. Uh, studied like crazy, um, had photos. We didn't have TikTok or um, Instagram or, you know, and certainly weren't millionaires at the age of 14. I'm not yeah. even sure we've even reached millionaires at the age of 83, but we do okay. Yeah, well, you you had a, an actual really wonderful career. I mean, I, from what I've, <laughs> I've found. And, you know, that's the thing. You know, I have to go through two different sources to get uh, different information. And sometimes it, some sites will contradict each other. Uh, yeah, don't, don't go by IMDb. I did not start. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did not start in the, uh, uh, in the 50s. It just has me doing some films in England or something. None of that. I'm okay. Started in the 60s. Yeah. Okay. After your military service. After just before military service, I did some TV, which is not even in my record. I mean, I 
guest starred on some TV stuff, but not um, on uh, television, on tape, when stuff was taped and, okay. and things of that nature. But that, you know, you don't see that on the uh, information on IMDb, pretty much. It's, I think they started with uh, Damaged Goods, a film where I get syphilis or something. Syphilis. Okay. <laughs> That's a, a good start for a, yeah. an acting career. But yeah. did you ever do on stage acting? Yes, I did on stage acting, but uh, not Broadway or anything like that. That's I leave that to my daughter. No, I did um, local stage, uh, local theater, which was great because I studied with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Corey Allen. And eventually Corey became a director, directed Star Trek. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that, that's how you got. But it, it does say that you played in the original series of Star Trek. Well, the uh, next generation. Oh, just next generation. Okay, because some sources have you with William Shatner and, oh, and such. No. no, never. Okay. Oh, totally wrong. No, just the uh, the next generation, and then um, Deep uh, Deep Space Nine. I did four of those. Really, uh, four different characters, aliens. Two different characters. One very creepy thing with long braids, looked like an Egyptian, whatever, with a face that looked like mashed potatoes, green mashed potatoes. And uh, the other one was a Bajoran. I did a two-parter of Bajoran. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, I'll have to read. Deep Space Nine is actually my favorite Star Trek iteration because I just thought the story overall was better and everything. So, but uh, all right. Um, okay. Uh, was there anyone uh, in particular that inspired or encouraged you to follow this path? Any mentors? No real mentors. No. I was fortunate uh, that despite all the uh, the opposite not not physical opposition but vocal opposition from family my mom said go do what you have to do if you can't do what you love to do in this life then it ain't worth living baby and i said okay and we were poor and i had some opportunities to to go into a factory and work in a business that somebody wanted me to take over and i said i can't do that that's not what i want to do in my life and uh, as poor as we were i said i have to do what i want to do so my mother uh she supported me which was great it's good to have family support or you know friends and surroundings for any type of like when i started youtube it was about uh, two years ago uh well here you're on a year and a half and um, you know the first person i asked was my girlfriend and she's like do it just go ahead do it and then uh i checked with some youtubers that i uh, followed already and uh, one of them said, yeah, just do something. I'll watch it. I'll let you know what I think. And, uh, right. So that's how it started. So you need, people, uh, you. Yeah, you need people to support you. Yeah. Well, exactly. It's, I was I uh, last uh, two weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Neil Ross and it was the opposite. He had no support and he was. Yeah, it, it was miraculous how he went through all of this. So I was I was amazed. Yeah. So you did teach him, right? At some point, he signed up for yes. one of your classes. I had a class early in my career when I was really doing really, really well. And I had my own theater, live theater. And uh, I taught him. Uh, I worked with Kat Susi, who's quite successful now, and Rusi Taylor, the late Rusi Taylor. Uh, Lauren Lester studied with me. And uh, um, uh, Robert, Bob, uh, um, studied with me, who does Porky Pig and all those wonderful characters. Bob Bergen. And... Okay. Uh, I, there's a whole list of them, and uh, I was fortunate that I got some talented people in there, and just just gave them, uh, you know, some some rules, some spark, and they went on to. In fact, some of them got jobs over me. Cam Clark got a job that I was up for. He came to class. He said, "I got a job." I said, "We all went, whoa, yay!" And I, <laughs> and I said, "What did you do? What did you get?" He told me. And I went, "I read for that." <laughs> there's there was this silence. I said, Cam, it's great. What, what, wow, that, what a great reflection. I am thrilled. And uh, don't go home in the dark because I'm going <laughs> Exactly. But that's, I mean, it's still fun, you know, because you know you helped him to get there. So, you and know, he, that, he's done characters that I've done. In other words, if I wasn't available, they said, bring in Cam. If Cam was on, they said, bring him back because our voice tone was very similar at that point in our careers. It's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, you know, repeating business or, you know, at least you can uh, feed off each other. So that's yeah. good. Uh, you've been a teacher of voiceovers for almost as long as you've been in the business. You've given classes and uh, you even had a YouTube channel for Bell Tritel Productions. 
uh, which I just found out about uh, last week. Uh, what drove you to teach? And how often do people realize too late that it's more about acting than just having a great voice? They do. They do realize. Uh, I, 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 I love teaching. I loved, I don't know if I love it still. I still teach sometimes, but I really love teaching. When I have my own theater, I use that as a platform so people could work. And uh, I teach, I don't know if you're nurse, I also teach um, Japanese students the, the art of uh, voiceover for anime. And I've been teaching for 11 years. They fly in from Osaka and uh, Tokyo and regions out there about 18, 19 years old. Or they really? College or late high school. And I teach about somewhere between 50 to 90 kids at a time. And I have an interpreter. And I am with Toshiwa Sensei Michael Bell. And uh, I teach them uh, uh, how to do uh, anime, what, well, how to do uh, character voices for anime, animation, whatever. Really? Right. So, okay, so these they, they speak Japanese. They come, there's a translator that translates everything you tell them. Everything. I say, don't then. leave anything out. Even if I get dirty, no matter what I say, you tell them. And the kids love it. They laugh, they enjoy it, and, and it's a whole different world. I have to teach them how to laugh to start with, because that's important, to have a sustained laugh. You always end a, sh you always end a show with, <laughs> you're the bad guy, right? So you have to teach them how to laugh. And the Japanese don't laugh with their mouth open. They do that. Yes, yeah. very quiet laugh. And very quiet laugh. So I have to have somebody hold their hands so they can laugh out. It's really fun. It's, it's great. It, it, it was really great fun. But it's so they and then they go back and then they do the voices for if, if they, animation. If they're interested in continuing their career. Not everybody does, not even locally, obviously, when I teach locally. You know, people don't or and they're of a certain age and they think, well, I don't want to give up my job and I don't have to start going out on auditions. And it's a whole different world when you're standing in front of somebody and you have to perform. But some of them have become successful and I've gotten every now and then I get something from somebody saying, Thank you so much. In Japanese. But you have to, there's a thing, like it's a commitment. You have to, because I'm I'm not a voice actor. I'm not, I'm just basically, I wanted to do YouTube for Transformers. I mean, I do toy reviews as well, but right. I wanted to find something different. And nobody that I knew that I followed did anything about the voice acting. And basically they had a new show uh, called War for Cybertron about a year ago on Netflix. And uh, the voice acting was terrible for some. Uh, the, 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 the main complaint about the show was pacing and voice acting. And I found out that that could be my niche. Like I could just show people what good voice acting was. Yeah. So I went back and, you know, started with uh, Dan Gilvezan and then it just started Dan. there. Okay. Yeah. I've been trying to contact Dan for a while now and, uh, he, it, his website, it doesn't seem to have anybody who, uh, who's monitoring the email right now. So. But uh, yeah, and I, you know, eventually I'll, uh, you know, there's a uh, IMDB for all its fault actually does have contact information for people if you subscribe to it. So I might eventually do that. Yeah, Dan's Dan's a good guy. My 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 class is at Michael Bell Voice Animation, a uh, class. Michael Bell Voice Animation. Lori Tritel teaches a uh, commercial voiceover, so she it's like a connecting thing. So you can switch on to her, switch on to me. I teach voice animation, and I have. I think it's five or six kids who are were interested in working in the Groundlings, which is a major, major uh, improv and sketch organization out here, the top of the line. But they mm -hmm. did do voices, so I said, "Would you sit in, and uh, and we'll um, and I'll I'll work with you and teach you at the time." So it's it's really great for us. So one and it's it's free. It's an hour and a half of free training from me, from me. Exactly. Well, you I have to say. You're the exception to the rule, those who can't teach. Because you can, you still can, you did it, you excelled at it, and then you taught. And you were good at that too. So Thank you. I mean, that no, it just said it, it's just something that you know I realized. I'm like, okay, not all you know vo acting coaches are people that just did it make it. Right. So right. but it's uh, it's uh now you had a good career. I mean you yeah, are you still active today? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. You made me sound like I was ready to dig a hole and throw myself into it. <laughs> no. uh, I'm, uh, I'm dubbing. Uh, they're dubbing for Netflix. I dub foreign films. Okay. 
Oh, okay. So, um, any, um, is it, uh, that's actually one of my questions uh, that I had for uh, curiosity because one of the, the, the thing with Netflix is that they went for the, the new Transformers show. Uh, they went with non union unionized actor. Yeah. So that's, is that a point of contempt? Like, is it known that there's some area that they just don't respect the business by just picking people? You said it's a matter of saving money. They don't want to spend the money, and we don't. We don't. We, it's it's not a lot of money for us for them to pay us. We don't ask for you know trillions uh, or billions or even thousands. Quite frankly, I think it's not. It's a little less than that. Uh, uh, they don't want to have to pay residuals. Uh, that is is was wow. our, our life's blood, and uh, I guess you know. And they can. They probably can push around somebody who's non-union. Uh, because they're non-union doesn't mean they're not talented. I'm not going to go there. There are some very talented people that are non-union. They just haven't had the opportunity to join the union. I know from years ago, trying to join the union was very hard. Uh, okay. it's, a little, it's a little easier today. If you belong to TikTok, you're, automatically you can join the union. If you do Instagram, you can join the union, which is really horrendous. Really horrendous. It um, is. Yeah, but but in any event, the, the bottom line is that they... They want to, you know, uh, get people cheap on the cheap, and they probably pay them a couple hundred bucks, and then maybe don't even give them residuals, and there's no payment towards their uh, uh, their pension or their pension and health. So it's on the cheap, and I hate it, especially for solid characters like that. Well, yeah, there's what there was, you know, from like I said, the the new Transformers show. There was some good characters like Elita one. Uh, they had a talented young actress called Lindsay Russo, who was amazing in her role. Uh, but then for Optimus Prime, uh, they didn't want to pay for Peter, I guess. And uh, they decided to go with uh, uh, an impressionist. So he could do a good P Peter Cullen impression, but he couldn't act. So I don't know if you've seen the Christian Bale Batman, but when he, Optimus got angry, he sounded like Batman. You know, yeah. there, wasn't, there, there wasn't any uh, authenticity to it. Out of character you didn't feel the emotion because you know impressionists are not actors so yeah. that it's it, it, anyway it, it, that, it, that's, it, that's one of the things i teach is the fact that being an impressionist doesn't make you an actor that's one of the things that i teach i mean it's i and i can make comparisons with some great impressionists who are actors and some who aren't and who still have that opportunity to do things so uh, and you know the big stars that they use for animation for all the animation they generally do their own voice. They don't do three voices like we do. They're not called upon to do more than one voice as a general rule because they can't. It's not what they do. They do their voice. That's the actor they hire. That's the star. And, you know, the stars are behind them. So, And then we sometimes come in and fill the small roles like the beggar or the, the old man selling pies or the old lady getting hit by a car or something. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's the thing with movies. You know, there's, I don't know if that was part of my, because uh, I've asked that to, uh, to John Machida, like, you know, uh, the, um, the fact that there's celebrity voice actor who are hired by the studio for the publicity stunt and everything, but then, and then those roles could easily have been filled by you guys. No, no contest. It's just a name that they slap on the poster to say, Okay, we have I don't know Justin Timberlake to or Dwayne the Rock Johnson to to do yeah. so. That is that's a point of contempt uh, for you or the, the 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 actors in general, the voice actors, or is it something that's understood and accepted as you know if they want to keep making movies, they need to draw the crowd, so we're going to use big names. But it doesn't necessarily draw the crowd. First of all, I think. I, I can't speak for the other actors. I, I know we talk about it, and they're all not thrilled with the idea that movie stars are replacing their voices or TV stars. I can go for my own example. Uh, when I did um, uh, the Smurfs, the series for a number of years, yes, you did. the movie, and they and I had to call my agent and say, "Well, they're doing the movie, the Smurfs. I'd like to, I'd like to know if I'm going to be in that." And they said, "Well, they'll let you read for it." So I said okay what part they said grouchy and i said okay because grouchy is what i did and i read for grouchy they said but they want him to be a young grouchy i said i was young when i did it so what does that mean so i said okay and i made him a little younger and they wound up giving it to uh joe manginelli or joe manginelli whatever his yeah name. i i know who you're talking oh, to yeah yeah he didn't do any voice at all he just did his own voice 
which wasn't like that. You know, I didn't do that. He just did his own voice. And they did this with other people. They 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 used um, movie stars. It wasn't a successful film. It bombed miserably. Now, it yep. may have brought some money in because family brought their kids to see it. The same thing now with Rugrats. Uh, they have the new Rugrats show. And I said, am I going to be doing it? Because I know the girls are, you know, they, they play the little kids. And they said, no, they're going to go with celebrities. So they have three celebrities playing the three voices that I did. Three celebrities doing the separate voice. They had to pay them a large buck. Yeah. You know, do you think the kids at home know that Henry you know. Winkler or Tony Hale or the other guy are, are, are the voices? They don't know. They're little kids. They want, they want to see the show, which is great. Well, the new show, and I'm, and I'm here, and if somebody hears me, too bad, um, may not be that great because according to the residuals I'm getting from the old show, people are watching the old show. They're buying the DVDs. They're tuning into the old one. So obviously they screwed up. I think Paramount screwed up by, by going CGI instead of animation. You know, Absolutely. So That's a missing art these days. Uh, and drawn animation or even just two dimensional, you know, it's two dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it was uh, something that's been lost with all the CGI. And also I think that they're not doing the, the proper thing with CGI. Uh, you know, Toy Story was a good, you know, a good movie, you know, the animation was fun, but then I would have went with more, more movies that look more realistic, like uh, Final Fantasy, The Spirit Within. That was just, you know, the story was terrible, but the animation was great. Yeah. So, and anyway, it missed, to, you know, everybody has different opinion and everything, but yeah. I understand your point. I mean, it's it for, you know, you guys being replaced. I mean, at least in TV shows, you're not yet, you know, they, they don't hire celebrities yet. To, to do uh, voices for uh, for TV characters. That's still a business that, you know, gets back to you. What do you mean for TV characters? TV animation, you mean? Yeah, yeah, TV animation. Like, uh, you know, uh, There's plenty of stars doing TV animation. The, the guys that I mentioned in Rugrats, they're quite successful. They're, they're big names and they're doing Rugrats. And I, I see, <clears throat> when I look at the breakdowns, that they've hired at least one celebrity, uh, some name, to play a role in an, in an animated show on television. I don't know if they can hold on to them, um, if they're really a big celebrity. I know in, um, um, I was it Captain Planet? We all were given roles in Captain Planet in the last minute they changed us out. So Tom Cruise took over for, I think for, uh, for Neil Ross, took over for Neil Ross. Um, I forgot the act, big major actor, Joe, uh, uh, Coburn, James Coburn took over for my character. Okay. And uh, and uh, Whoopi Goldberg took over for somebody else. Uh, all of us were voice actors, and they couldn't continue the series. They had to rehire uh, or hire other people to continue the series because those stars were too busy. So they got them for the pilot, and that was it. So much it was. It was a deep production. It was one of the beginning of things. We were going, "What the hell's going on?" I was replaced by James Coburn. Why? Well, because they wanted names in the pilot. Even for I didn't think that uh, I didn't know that Captain Planet had that happen to uh, no, you know. Tom Cruise. Come on, you're going to get Tom Cruise. Yeah, we're great. You know, well, somebody said to me, "Gee, they got Tom Cruise." I said, "Yeah." I said, "They got." I said, "And you know, uh, it's it's like um, I said I was offered the role, and I said, "Look, I was offered the role of Born on the Fourth of July," and I said, "I don't want to do that. Give it to Tom Cruise," which is which is my standard joke, you know. Tom, no, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to do that. Give it to Neil Ross or give it to Michael Bell or give it to Frank Welker or give it to people who do voices, who don't do on camera anymore. No, it's and, not and, and then they actually did Tom Cruise. That's that. Because I remember for... Uh, and big bucks. We're talking... Of course. Well, there was a, another Transformer show about early 2000. That was a... Uh, it went as a... Uh, like a sideshow for the new um, live action movie of Transformers. Mm -hmm. It was called Transformers Prime. And uh, the voice of Cliff Jumper, who used to be Casey Kasem, was actually done by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And he was only there for the, the pilot episode, and they killed off his character afterwards because they couldn't pay couldn't, him. They couldn't get him. They, couldn't, they, couldn't, they may have wanted to pay him, but they couldn't get him. And they don't mind paying him. People say, oh, it's about money. No, it's not about money. You know, they got tons of money to pay. It's about meeting the star, having lunch with him getting together with them, patting them on the back, 
getting a, an autograph for their kid. That's what it's about. They're as much star efforts as um, anybody else. Well, hey, the, see, they should do like me. Just start a YouTube. You, you get to meet people. So that's interesting. But yeah. come on. Just, you know, that to me, that's costing jobs to actual, you know, working actors. Yes, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. It's terrible. Uh, all right. Uh, number four, I think. Yeah. Um, you reprised the role of Sideswipe for Transformers Devastation. Uh, alongside many of the original cast of G1. Was it like slipping in an old shoe or was it a very different experience? It was different because I hadn't done it for some time. So I said, could you play me a scratch track to see what the heck? Because I did so many roles, I don't know, what was it I doing? What, what was I doing? You know, because one of the characters was Irish. The other character was slow speaking. that had a deeper voice. The other one had a higher voice. You know, who knows what I was doing? So we were going at such a pace. So I said, could you play it back? They played it back when, ah, okay, right. So I said, got it. So then you got back. See, this is the uh, latest iteration of, uh, of Sideswipe. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I think I, I, think I have one. It's, yeah. I'm going to look at that. I'm sure you. I think I have it. Is this it? Is this it? And this is what we're talking about. Uh, oh, that's uh, actually, that's uh, this one. This is basically, uh, this is the Cybertronian mode. So basically, that's what Sideswipe would would look like Yeah. on Cybertron. But then this one here, they did another one on another toy line, which is basically the Earth mode. So when you transform him, this one looks exactly like Sunstreaker because they're twin. Well, somebody gave that to me. You know, I have fans that, that give me some lovely gifts. So uh, that was, uh, I just got that. That's perfect. So have people gifted you collectibles over the years that you've you've kept? And you know, I don't know if they're collectibles. I just know that it's a nice thing to do, and I take it, and I, I have my little trophy room, which my daughter said I'm not allowed to give anything away because I used to give stuff away. I used to just, hey, you want this? I'll sign it. It's yours, whatever, some kid or something. She said, don't do that anymore. This is my legacy. It's my inheritance. <laughs> okay, you got it. So you mentioned that your daughter was also an actress. Yeah, her name is Ashley Bell, and uh, she has she she did a she starred in at people like horror films a film called The Last Exorcism a number of years ago, which is a sensationally scary film. Yeah, yeah, the last. Uh, the last. Yeah, yeah, I saw that like a, a, a camera handheld type thing, and the guy he goes into church. Right. And okay, so who's she playing in that? The, the possessed. She's the star. Oh my God! Yeah, That's I love that movie. See, did you ever see the day? A film called The Day. It's about the. It's one of those uh, apocalypse films where the world is pretty much destroyed itself, and uh, the combination of people who became cannibals and people who are still trying to survive as human beings. And she's the uh, one of the female stars in that. There's two female stars, uh, Shanna and herself, and she's and it's great fun. It's a dark film. I note it. You said The Day. It's called The Day, yeah. And she also did um, uh, Carnage Park, a horror film. She finally, she's now in the Groundlings in Hollywood, which is an improv group, and she's one of the new Groundlings in the Sunday Company. And she's very funny. So having done these horror films, it was so funny to know she did all these horror films. She was doing horror films, and she herself is very funny. She's very comedic. Well, she thinks from her dad. Well, you, you've, been, you've been hilarious in, in panels. And I have to say, okay, in all the research I do and everything, I watch interviews you've done with other YouTubers, other people once in a while, and you challenge people on the spot, and I I can see the glee in your eyes. Like there was this girl, very you know attractive woman, but she and then she asked, oh she and she said, oh this is Michael Bell, and he voiced some of my favorite characters, and then you said such as, and she blanked, like she had to process it she didn't know it on top of her head and you've done that a couple of times and it's it's hilarious to me you I, know. I come from a family so don't 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 uh, blow smoke up my nose if you tell them if you're really gonna ask me something and you know what you've been doing like an attorney you better know the answer that, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get you but uh, it's just it's it's funny you know not everybody will will challenge people like that so I just thought that was hilarious have I ever seen you at a convention Ever? No, I've actually I'm going to my first Transformer convention ever uh, at Tor in Toronto next Friday. Super, really super. Well, I have to tell you, you'll 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 love it. It's really great fun. 
I've done a lot. I just finished one recently in, in Augusta, Georgia, and I got one coming up in Connecticut and one coming up someplace else. But uh, <clears throat> I, I've had people come by that were so, such great fans and just knew what I did, et cetera, and it was really great to deal with. And I had one guy come by a couple of cons ago, and he, he went through my table, and I have all this thing laid out. I mean, I've got every picture from not every show, but at, at least 60% of the shows because there's not enough tables. And I, we put that out, and he went through the whole thing. He said, I don't know anybody in here. And I said to him, well, get the F away from my table. <laughs> and he, and he looked at me, and I didn't say F. I said, get the F away from my table. And he looked at me, and I, and I said, uh, and, and he said, what? I said, you heard me. Go bother the $6 million man. Tell him you don't know who the hell he is. Uh-huh. Yeah, people are just rude sometimes. And really rude. Yeah. But that's. That's this, you know. Don't don't futz around. I'm 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 not gonna play with you. Yeah. Well, it's like, but you do play off people in panels that, and everything. Yeah, that They're I, gonna ask yeah. you something, and you're right there with them. So mm -hmm. that's it makes for a better experience, I think. Like I know Greg Berger is gonna be at TFCon Toronto. Yes, great. You and uh, okay, so give me a quick advice. I I've already sent him a my video of him. I did. Yeah. And uh, he replied that he loved it and he was great. Then I asked him for an interview, but then I haven't heard since. You'll hear. But should I bring that up if I meet him at TFCon or should I not bring it up? Well, I would bring my mic with me and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a tape, you know, tape, whatever, you, whatever you carry with this portable. And I'd, and I'd say, could you take some time? I'd love to do an interview. And I imagine you will. Right there. On the spot. On the spot. Are you pulling my leg? Because I'm going to do it. I'm telling you, see, Michael Bell said to do this. So okay, I will. We do interviews on, you know, on the spot. Uh, I don't know if the guys will be with him, whether Neary or uh, Chris will be with him. But uh, you tell Greg that I said he should do it for you. That Neil okay. did an interview and all the other guys are doing interviews. He should do it for you. I said he should do it. Okay, I will. I, I will. And then I'll send you an email after that to let you know how that happened, uh, okay. how it went. Good. So, but thank that That's good advice. Sure. I'm always nervous to be like, that's why I waited a year before sending you your video and everything. Cause I'm always um, nervous to come across an annoying fan or borderline a stalker. And, uh, but uh, people around me have been giving me advice to dare more. And that's what I've been doing for the past. That's it. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's actually paid off. I mean, you're my third guest on uh, my channel and I hope I can get more. So you should get BJ Ward. Who? BJ. Oh, you don't know BJ Ward from, uh, from, uh, uh GI Joe. Okay. No, I don't know. I I'm mostly a transformers collector, but I'm, I'm branching out in, uh, when I do voice acting, I see, Everything else, like I know you did over, you know, you did three main characters on Rugrats, but you did over 30, maybe 40 of side characters and everything. So that's the the, the, the beauty of um, what I do uh, for me is that I learned, like when I did your video, I start with, okay, Transformers and okay, you did uh, Plastic Man and, you know, at G.I. Joe, you did uh, Duke and uh, Lift Ticket, Major Blood. And then I keep going and I'm like, Oh my God, you're Raziel. And as you can see, although it's spelled incorrectly, my channel is Raziel Kane Reviews. So, I, because I, that's what I started calling myself when I was doing video games, you know, online gaming and everything. You always need a gamer tag. And then I just picked the two characters from the Legacy of, uh, Legacy of Kane franchise. But because it was already taken as Raziel Kane spelled properly, I just switched it around. And this okay this it won't tell you anything but it this is actually a starscream mold painted with the color of Razia. yeah yeah i see that yeah my sister did the scarf and <laughs> i don't know if it's gonna show but his mouth is actually cut off now it's not picking up properly i just i can see that it's cut off though that's yeah. fine. it's so so that's my mascot is raziel gain that's what i call him that's funny so, and uh, yeah, it was a friend of the channel uh, input. He's a customizer. He does does tons of customs. So I just hey, can you do one you know with the color brass yell? And he was like, oh, that's a great idea. And he just did it. So that's funny. 
Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's well, it's kind of thanks to you. I mean, that's why I started, you know, uh, using the Raziel Kane thing because Legacy of Kane really, it I'm sure it made people speak better because the script was so well written, um, and the, the well the the talents that you worked with for that that show uh, was legends in their time. I spoke so, to Simon a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago. I, I did, uh, Simon and I did a Zoom together. Okay. Who was Kane, of course. He was what? He was Kane. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I know the, uh, the yes. some of the names I don't remember. I know uh, René Aubergine was in Legacy of Kane um, as was, well. Simon Templeton was Kane. And he's okay. a marvelous actor, marvelous actor. And we talked and I said, he says he gets letters or emails and stuff and he he just never occurred to him what they were talking about at first because he you know, does a lot of work and not a lot of uh, animation but a lot of on-camera work and then we talked about it and i said maybe one of these do days we'll do a raziel and kane con you know if we can talk people into it i don't know if there'd be enough of a draw i know i get a lot of calls for raziel but not as much as transformers and gi joe but i said that'd be kind of great and he, he he was up for it yeah but well, i think it would you know, maybe not if you did it every year, but if you do a one-time con yeah. of Raziel and Kane, the, the whole legacy of the Kane thing. Yeah. All followers of that franchise are really dedicated and are extremely attached to the characters. Right. It was such an endearing story and complex. And you, you basically just played the game to get to the next cutscene. You, you, know, you know I couldn't play the game. Yeah, I, I heard you say that on uh, another interview. So, but it's it. Actually, you know what? I've never f completely finished it. No. Oh no, no, no! I was terrible at that game, but I just had to go through. So I watched walkthroughs and everything. But eventually, not uh, not a year ago, I rewatched every cutscene on YouTube, everything, the whole story, wow. just uh, you know, relive those uh, those moments. Cool. Uh, because it's it's an intricate story, and it you know, but the the time travel and everything and. Yeah. The whole paradox is it, it's amazing so it's a but it's one of the franchise i wish would have continued yeah they dropped i think they dropped the ball i maybe maybe i don't know if amy if amy stayed uh because amy eventually left i think but the think the company folded and amy went elsewhere but uh i think they dropped the ball with the franchise because it really was a super game it was and then they tried to do a um, online game uh, like World of Warcraft with Legacy of Cain, and then that failed because they weren't, uh, they didn't even release it. It was just a game that they tried to, you know, put together, just didn't catch, didn't work. Really? So, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, point five. Um, often in interviews and panels, when you're asked about what drew you to a certain character, you often answer that it was a job. And uh, even if you really enjoyed the part. Uh, but I've seen a lot of actors, and I always use Gary Gary Chalk as a reference because he's very attached to his Optimus Primal character. So you have you on one side who's who, who comes across maybe detached, you know, just it's a job. I did, you know, what I had to do, and I enjoyed the experience. And then there's Gary who's recently has been in the news, well, not the ma mainline news, but on Twitter. Um, and he's he's seen a bit uh, bitter to the fact that he wasn't asked to reprise the role of Optimus Primal for the, the new movie. So my question is, do you think that your approach of it's a job might be healthier for an actor, uh, a way to detach himself from the roles they sometime create? You know, I don't I don't can't speak for Gary, uh, but I'm sure he feels the way I do. Even though you don't have to be attached to a character you could you could have a favorite character something you really like to do i don't know how much work gary does i'm not familiar with his, his history mm -hmm. that may be a real important character for him in terms of funding as well and popularity and, and a continued job um i i did so many characters that it's hard for me to say, oh, I love this one most, or this one I'm really attached to. Yeah, I can say that I, I was very upset when I found out they uh, they gave Chucky's dad, Chaz, to uh, another actor, and mm -hmm. Grant Morris, because I developed those voices. 
those are things those weren't given to me i came up with those characters and uh, that that bothered me a lot um when they wanted to kill me in the movie of gi joe i said what are you gonna kill me for kill don johnson nobody knows who he is he's an <laughs> voice that maybe nation people don't care about don johnson so they didn't kill me but i had no say uh on uh prowl i mean they wound up killing prowl yeah and, but I wasn't attached to Prowl. Or Prowl. Was, yeah, Pr Prowl is great. I wasn't attached to him. Of course, I wound up continuing to do this series. But because I, I did so many Transformers, Prowl was the easiest for me to do because it was close to my voice. <clears throat> you know, that was, sure. yep. it was close to me. You know, a little bit steely, a little bit uh, um, Clint eastwood -y, whatever. But for the most part, when you're doing a role that is rich and full and Someone like Raziel, I would not have been thrilled that they'd done another game and chose somebody else for Raziel because it, that felt like it was mine. But I wouldn't make a big fuss about it. I just say, that's really crappy, guys. And it's. Uh, it, it, I, I don't think I could watch or play another Legacy of Kane game if you weren't behind Raziel. Yeah, but you can. No, I got to tell you, you can. People say to me, people say to me, um, well, I'm never going to watch Red Rats again. Yeah, you will. Or I'm never going to watch G.I. Joe again if, if they're a place you was doing. Yeah, you will. Because it's nature. It's human nature. When when they said, are you going to be doing the uh, the movie Transformers, the voices? And I said, I haven't been asked. Well, I'm not going to go. Well, sure you go. You want to see. You want to see what it is. The fact that the movie sucked had nothing to do with it. The point is that. And it did suck. It would have died had the fans not gone. Had the fans really not gone. Really didn't go they would have tore their hair out because they wouldn't have made any money at all. Well, you know, he made a ton of money on it because the fans wanted to see it. As bad as the film was, they stayed to the end. Yeah. That didn't make any difference that my voice wasn't in it. And Frank, the first one, Frank Welker's voice wasn't in it. And uh, Dan Galveston's voice. And then when they did, um, uh, what is it? Bumblebee. And they used a wrestler who's now an actor as opposed to Dan. And Dan's voice sounds the same. He's, he's the same guy. Hey, yeah, Dan, Dan was only you know he only reprised the role of Bumblebee once for the Devastation game, yeah. and I think that's really sad. But it's you look at the movie Bumblebee, and he, he's a parody of himself. You know, yeah. he sounds more like uh, you know just a tin can with uh, you know beep boop boop. He's like an R two D two type the character. Thing, the thing was, the movie was good. I saw it only because I wanted to see what Dan. What Bumblebee Dan, was really good. Yes, that was good. It was nicely written, and you could get identify with the character. The other clips I've seen in the Transformers, the movies, they suck. I mean, you know, uh, he he, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care that it sucks because. He's got young um, stars, live, you know, live stars doing it. Then he's got big superstars names. Uh, for the yep. most part, you still have. They're smart enough to get uh, to get um, Frank recently in the last one, I think, and Peter, of course. And he and it's hell. I want to see what what on camera actor could do Starscream. What on camera actor could do it? Nobody I know that could do that voice. They had to get someone like Charlie or someone that has that quality that they can do that at that pitch and not bleed from the lungs, you know, that, that Chris had. Chris had that naturally. Yes. How was working with Chris? <laughs> Chris was uh, in a world of his own. Chris was a stand-up comic, as you probably know. Yep. So he didn't have an unexpressed thought. And when you're in a room full of people and he's going on and, and – and, uh, and he also, when he worked, uh, Chris sweat a lot he, because he was hot in there. I was heard everything there. And when he would turn around and go, ah! and his sweat would go everywhere. And I said, he would go to the end of the room. I'd get a mic at the end of the room because I didn't want to stand next to him because you literally were drenched by the time he was finished. Now, he was uh, and talented, talented guy. That voice was great. You know, he was uh, in G.I. Joe, and of course, as he was Star Trek and uh, Transformers. Yeah, he did. He's gone too soon. That oh, yeah. yeah. Very, very sad. Um, okay. Um, for my own curiosity now, I have a couple more questions. Uh, okay, we mentioned that you've been involved with Star Trek um, from uh, the next generation pilot episode and then Deep Space Nine, some video games. 
Um, was it um, working from Next Generation to Deep Space Nine? Is it the same feel uh, or it was very different because it was a different show? It felt different. Yeah, it did feel different. You're right. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, Sci-fi, but it, uh, it, it was a different bag. It just had a different feeling to it. Yeah, I don't know what, what it was, it just did. But don't forget, I only did the pilot. Everybody was feeling different. It was all new for everybody. Uh, and Deep well, Space it was, but it pilot. was a great pilot. Yeah, and Deep Space had already been on, I think it was. So, you know, they, everybody there was pretty comfortable. And the guests, yeah, mostly guest stars that I worked with. So I was a guest star and working with guest stars. Yeah, well, well you work with Jonathan Frakes and Mariana Sirtis. They were yeah. in... Uh, those scenes and uh and it's uh you know that crew went on for seven years and the fact that you you sold a great performance as zorn and you. who's a uh basically a space jailer or you know who so, been, yeah, uh, he saved his planet so he, he had he was a slaver he yeah slaved. exactly and it's you know it's another you know the highway to hell is paving good intention he really wanted to save his planet and he was helping the creature survive but you know, manipulated at the, the same yeah. time. So now the thing about that thing about that is that uh, I originally read for Q, and uh, Gene Roddenberry said, um, "Do me a favor and read this." And he read this, gave me this other role. And I said, just, "Just go outside for a while." And Corey said, "Just you know, get, take a look at it." I said, "Okay." And they said, "You need a couple of hours." I said, "No, no, I'm just read off the cuff." And I came in and I started reading Grappler Zorn in an older voice because it she looked like an old guy in the drawing, whatever they gave me. Yep. And, and he, I went, they said, you know, and he said, no, 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 use your voice, Mike. I said, my voice, I have a young voice. And he said, no, but that's what they look like. They look like that, but it's, you can use your voice. I went, seriously, okay, fine. And I did it and read it, and he said, okay, it's yours. I said, huh? Because that is now it works. Generally, you read, they thank you, you leave, and a week later you find out you did or you did, or you did, did get it. You never find out if you didn't until somebody else is it's on television. So he just gave it to you right on the spot. And, right on the spot, yeah. So how was working with Gene Roddenberry? I mean, we've that's heard tons of things, but that's all I saw of him was that. And then he said to me, "You don't remember me, do you?" Now Gene Roddenberry says to me, "You don't remember me," and I said, "I'm sorry. I, I guess I should." What he said, "You did." So then came Bronson for me, the pilot with Michael Parks. I went, "Ow." <laughs> And you still want to hire me? And he said, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. No problem. I said, okay, fine. Because I fought with Michael Parks and walked off the set. And oh, really? Yeah. So a little, uh, uh, an actual fight? No, it was, uh, it was, um, it could have gone there, but it didn't. And I just told him what a schmuck he was and in different terms. And, uh, yeah. and I said, when you're ready to work like a professional, give me a call. And I went over and sat with the extras with the uh, background actors. And they all went, oh man. And then, then the director came down, I think it was Chris Columbus came down and he said, what happened? And I said, he doesn't want to work. He doesn't know his lines. If he doesn't know his lines, I can't work. You know, Chris, he went, well, he said, you didn't know your lines. I said, that, he what? <laughs> he did what? I was furious. Cause he was he was fooling around with the, with the actress. He wanted to impress her. So he thought uh -huh. he would take on he would take on the uh, the uh, guest star. Uh, wrong guy. Wrong. Yeah, exactly. You picked the wrong guy. But wrong guy. Is, is that common in the industry? You know, act actors trying to impress people and just not actually doing their job, or no, not that I no, not not okay. work with. No, nobody I've worked with is like that. They're, everybody's very very serious. There's so much money riding on a show. Everybody's serious. I don't think anybody's. Yes, one actor. I'm sorry, yes, one act. Okay. I did a show, and it was like the last, one of the last on-camera shows other than Star Trek and Deep Space. That brought me out of retire, on-camera retirement. Uh, a show called Chips. I, I've heard, my mom told me a lot about Chips, yes. Ooh. I worked with an actor there who just thought he was the second coming, and he wasn't, he wasn't, and he was, as far as I'm concerned, he was, a, he was unbirthed. He was just never mind second coming. wasn't here at all. It was all about him, how he looked, and I took him on. Uh, but I finally said, "This is nuts. I don't want to have to do this. Work with somebody like that." And I was getting tired of on camera anyway. So I was playing bad guys all the time, or or uh, CIA or FBI. It was well, roles weren't that great. 
but you told the same girl which I was mentioning earlier, where uh, you know you challenged her on her saying that she, you know, uh, you played some of her favorite characters. But you told her, and this is your words, that you stopped doing on camera stuff because you were running after someone with a weapon, and then the director asked you, "That's a joke." <laughs> That's a different story. No, I said no. I started. That was the beginning of. That was the beginning of my feeling that I was in the wrong business. Okay. We were starting to lose my hair, and I wasn't. And I was so uncomfortable when we did outside shots. And I was doing uh, the FBI, where they're from Symbolist, and uh, and I was running down a, an alleyway or a parking lot and trying to get the, the bad guy. And I got my gun out, and the director went cut. And he said, "Mike, stop! Freeze! Don't move!" I said, "What? What are you doing?" I said, "I'm." I got the gun on him. He said, yeah, and uh, where's your other hand? And I said, I was like this. And went, where's your other hand? I said, it's on my head. He said, why? I said, because my hair's falling out, and I don't want anybody to see it. <laughs> and he said, but I'm head? looking at you now, and you, you, you have a full head of hair, you know, like. Transplants. Really? Okay, sorry. I don't want to pry. No, it's okay. We're talking about... 40 years, 30 years ago, something like that. Yeah. Finally, finally, finally bowed to it because of my ego. Didn't make any difference. I wasn't doing it on camera anymore. My ego said, oh, I don't want to see. I started started lose it as a result of the helmet I wore in the army. They said after a while, a lot of guys wear their helmets and okay. start to lose their hair. So but anyway, it was no big deal. It wasn't that far back. It was just just a little, it's just my hair was down to here. And so it's not yeah. And it's natural. Now it's fine. But the then, and I'm running and my hair goes up. It flies up in the wind because it's very soft hair. It flies up in the wind. And I felt like a schmuck running there. You know, and then after it's over, when I was standing there and the FBI guy fixed my hair while I got the gun on somebody. So, right. Okay. So that was it. But then later on, I did some more on camera. And then I just got wearisome with uh, with chips was the, was the nail in, in the uh, plank. That was it. And then after that, you just... Focused on voiceover. Focused on voiceover until Corey called and said, we want you to come in and read for uh, Star Trek. And I said, yes, I'm there. Well, I mean, a, a revival of such an iconic franchise. That oh, wow. must be something appealing. Oh, wow. And with, with an extraordinary English actor. Excuse oh, yeah. Me? Yeah. Well, Did you have any scene? Yeah, because it's been a long time since I've seen him. So you've worked with Patrick Stewart. Yeah, we had scenes. In fact, a couple of years later, when they were closing the show, when they were closing Star Trek, uh, we were at uh, a local recording studio. I was doing a lot of voiceover. I did a lot of voiceover, a lot of commercials. And he walked in, I'm with Patrick, and he said, Grappler, oh my God, we gave, gave each other hugs. And he said, I am so sorry. He said, I tried to get you in the final show. They were cute and they wanted to get, and I insisted that they get you. And it just wasn't in the script. And I said, it's okay, thank you for asking. Thank you it would have been, yeah, I mean, that would have been such a great nod to have and you in first guy the last guy yeah exactly you know they had q i mean i mean i think you could have done a good q as well i think so too yeah he keeps coming back yeah exactly recurring character and he, he more, yeah. you know very very uh egocentric and everything yeah. and it's such a great character so yeah, I, I hear he came back in the new star trek picard show i haven't he watched did. season two i'm told he did yes yeah so i maybe i'll uh, i'll go rewatch because uh, i season one just didn't grab me yeah it, it didn't feel like star trek oh okay so it, it was it was still good to see you know patrick stewart and all the uh, Brent, I mean, I remember when I teared up when I saw uh, Brent Spinner reprising Data, who had died in the last movie, and I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna watch this." And then went through everything, but then I felt that the overall story arc was lacking compared to when they tried to make it an action show rather than a sci-fi show. Which well, was they, were, they, were, they were they were bowing to the the need now the new need for people to see a lot of action, instant. Uh, 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 what is the word? Um, Joke. They need it. Yeah, they need yeah. it at this point. It's like people don't want to watch something too long without any crash bang. It's unfortunate. They mean that's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I I need a good story, like you know the legacy of Kane. I, I just wanted to have a uh, a good uh, a good experience, a good uh, and also in video games, you played in probably one of my favorite franchise, Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate. Wow. That goes you way played. back. 
Yeah, it does. Well, I mean, I'm still 44. So, yeah, uh, you played, um, okay, a dimension traveling tiefling bard named Erdelis, who's one of the recruitable character, and he, he's, he's such an amazing, fun character to have around. Uh, but when I give the description to me, I'm, I'm a Dungeons and Dragons player, so that makes sense. I'm curious as to how much background do they give actors um, on a Dungeon and Dragon characters? Do they tell you, okay, he's from this planes of existence and he's a bard and he's like, they give you a whole rundown and then you do the voice? Sometimes they do that. In fact, they do it to excess because you can't play that. You can't play your background. If you were, if I, if they said they want me, they want me to play you. I'm not going to ask you about your background. I'm not that kind of actor. I want to know your thought process now, how you feel about that situation, how you'd react in this situation. I don't want to know about your mom, your dad, your grandmother, grandfather, where they came from, an accident you had in third grade where you broke your leg. None of that makes a difference to who you are now, who I'd be playing. But they give you all this information. You can't play it, but they give you all that information. And yes, they do. Absolutely do. So they try to give you basically the motivation of the character, but you don't need it all the time. No, I, the motivation will be fine. The motivation is in the story. It's all in the story. It's not in your history. Okay. I can't play. I've always, hate, I've always hated you unless it's on the page. If on the page I see I've always hated him, I can play. I've always hated this guy. This guy was once my hero, and now he's a villain. I can play it at the time, but I can't play a background. Right. Our history, our history that I can't play. Which makes sense. That's so. Thanks for clarifying. But, it, but the writers want you to know what they're doing, and I get it. They 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 love their work so much. They just they you know I I have worked where they've said you know his mother was a hydra, and and she sprouted wings that they and I and I go oh wow and I'm thinking. I don't give an F. What do I care about his mother? I can't play his mother was a Hydra. Which makes sense. It, I, I get it. So that's, uh, but it's good to know. Like, I was just curious as to how much, because when, when I create a character for, to play Dungeons and Dragons, I go into history and everything so that I know how we got to that point where the campaign is going to start. That's you. Yes. Exactly. I get it. That's me. As a writer, yes. As a writer, performer, yes, you would have to. As the performer, I don't have to do the writer's job. I don't have to. I don't need to know that background. No, I, I get. Did you ever see the movie um, the, uh, Gamers? G A M E R S. It's about a group of Dungeon and Dragon players. Oh no, not that one. I was thinking about another one. Okay. No, it's very funny. Chris uh, Felino wrote and directed Gamers, uh, and I think Beverly uh, G A M E R S. Chris Felino. It has to be Chris Felino is the director. And it's about a group of, of uh, dungeon, dungeon, 40 year old dungeon and gra dragon players and, and how serious they are. And it's very funny because he was. So he knows, he knows his background. And it's very, very funny. Okay. So I'm going to check that out because, yeah, but we used to be like, I've been playing with the same friends from college since 1996. We've been playing different campaigns, different characters, and everything. Some of them, took it very seriously and others just were there for, you know, having fun and just not being at home, taking care of your responsibilities for a while. So that's, uh, you know, that's kind of still my motivation. I like to have that little four hours off where it's just about me and my fun. But and, the uh, one thing about this is that they keep picking on one guy and killing his character. It's a very, very funny thing. I don't understand it, but it's, and my voice is in it only because, I'm interviewing them. It's like an infomercial almost. Oh, my, okay. Am I going around with them and saying, so what got you into the, you don't see me, but you hear me. That's how I got connected to the film. So it's, it's much of the film, about 90% of the film is really knocked down funny. Made me laugh. Okay. All right. I'll give it, I'll give that a shot. And uh, okay. I'm just checking if I have any, okay. Uh, last questions that I have, because we've been through some of the stuff that uh, I had, uh, um, you know, we, we talked about non-unionized actors and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, any projects that you can tell us about right now that you're working on that's coming up or you're still under tons of NDA? Well, the only thing I'm going to be working on, again, but I can't go into it at great length, uh, for Blizzard, I do uh, 
of World of Warcraft. You know, I did World of Warcraft. Yep. Uh, you played uh, Medivh, the Medivh. prophet for, yep. Uh, but for this, I do a thing called Hearthstone. That's the card game, is it's it? It's a card game. I, do, I yeah, play, yeah, yeah. Okay. play a character. I can't think of his name. Uh, I play a, it's a really creepy guy. It looks like a giant um, octopus. Um, okay. I play a character in that, and I come back every year, maybe twice a year, and they have me. I'm recording next week or something. Yeah. Okay. So, but so that, but there's nothing other than that, than, than that that uh, you're. But you're still active. Oh, I need to confirm something. Yeah. Jack Angel. Uh, uh, the late Jack Angel. The, the late, late Jack Angel. Great. I. He's the next book I'm going to pick up because I I would have wished to interview him because when I did uh, the the spotlight on him I did tons of research and he he spoke a lot about uh, commercials and basically how you just needed to have one person fall in love with what you do and then you're almost set for life it's true and he gave you as an example he said everyone heard the legend of Michael Bell walking down a corridor and being asked to say the word butter <laughs> is that how it happened really what happened was I was starting to do uh, voiceovers, getting into voiceovers. I'd already been, you know, fairly successful on camera, and did a lot of shows, and I was getting into voiceovers. And they, uh, they said, "Here's the script," and I said, "It's one word. It's, a, it's butter." And they said, "Yeah, everybody's gonna be doing this." I said, "Okay." So I said, "I'll try four to five different ways: butter, 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 butter." Okay, send it. And they said, "Okay, him." Yeah. And for me, that's commercial history because uh, it lasted for five years or something. And it was huge. And we used to on every television show. They did a thing on President Reagan. Instead of saying guns, he opened up the thing and it said butter. And, <laughs> okay. uh, and then, uh, then there was uh, a guy opening up a coffin, a, a crypt, and then Pharaoh says butter. You know, and it's just, it just didn't stop. It's just, and uh, it got, and I was on entertainment tonight and they interviewed me. It was really fun. But is it, he ended the anecdote saying that you bought a house on the residual of that, those commercials that you called La Casa del Residuales? Los Residuales, yes. Los Residuales, bought a house at the beach, called it Los Residuales. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Yeah, and my house here in, in uh, where I live is uh, Butter Estates. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I mean, that's it. But, but I'm guessing that this is a rare happening, you know. No, because everything now is cable. In those days, I was doing broadcast, a lot of broadcast. And that was mm. a lot of residuals coming in. This, the session fee is not a lot of money. Session fee is a couple hundred bucks. But you hope that it takes off so the residuals really, and then you hope it becomes somewhat of a, a success so that there was second and a third and a fourth. And I did a ton of the parquet spots. Well, yeah, I mean, it's been, <clears throat> I was in uh, up North Quebec and we had uh, two uh, English channel. And I remember seeing that commercial. And because I, I think I was the only kid watching English stuff because I was the only one trying to impress the English teacher because she was a very good looking woman. And um, I watched tons of TV. That's when I picked up Transformers and He-Man and uh, Thundercats, Ninja Turtles. And so I was watching all those English commercials. And then I remember that little butter tub, you know, that, that margarine thing going butter. So, so I had, you know, that's, that's the fun thing of doing what I do is I discovered that sure. basically you've been in my life Ever since I, I was six years old. That's right. And it's the, the, the great thing is that I, every actor I research, I always find something that like uh, Paul Eiding. Oh, great. Yeah. I love Paul Eiding and he's been involved in Diablo. And I swear when I was 17, 18, Diablo was a job for me. I was playing at 40 hours a week, nonstop. And I just, it, it I honestly still play it once in a while. I still have it installed and I'll just, you know, play it. But now I know who, which character he, he played. So I make sure to do those quests, you know, just to, to hear him. So it, it's just some people you don't realize, but they've they've been with you unintentionally. And they've been part like, the you know, Raziel was a huge part of, you know, 
me starting my YouTube channel and picking that name to keep going. And so it just, it's amazing. I got, uh, I was very, very fortunate. I met uh, <clears throat> the designer of the Raziel um, figures, characters, wonderful, not the, the original, but I'm saying he does them for cons. Okay. And he gave me a beautiful, gigantic one that he had carved. It's really beautiful. Yeah, I'm looking for a Raziel and now they're, Three hundred, four hundred dollars. Oh, oh my God! A piece, yeah, and uh, also cane is very expensive. Um, what do you mean? Aren't there, aren't there a lot of them? I mean, aren't there a lot of designers? And well, there is a lot of toy companies uh, that do still, um, you know, toys uh, for cane and uh, but but not for older video games because the franchise died off. I got these as a gift. Wow. Yeah, never let that go. Your daughter's right. Never let that go because mint in box like that. And they gave me this too. Oh, man, he's gorgeous. Yeah, so you get these and it's sort of cool. So I got him his gifts. Yeah. And follow your daughter's advice. Just never let those go. All right. Will do. I just say I'm I'm looking for one, and they're just they're on eBay, and you know, so they're no longer in stores, and because it's still been a long time. So, and um, yeah, well, I'm really glad that uh, you came over the channel. Where uh, I told you about an hour, and now I'm eight minutes over. So I apologize. But, That's uh, a, it's we're into platinum time now. <laughs> there you go. So it's uh, it, thank you. I mean, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, sorry, everybody in the chat. I know I always say that uh, if I uh, have time, I'll uh, you know go to questions in the chat. But um, I talk too much, and uh, you know time runs out. Uh, but uh, I'm just gonna get ready for the outro. So I want to add anything else you want to say. Send us out. Just say hello to your mother and your father who are watching. And uh, I will teach your mom how to play the game. I will. <laughs> she might actually, uh, she's actually a good gamer. So she knows what this is about. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And uh, she's, uh, she lives a little far, but uh, I'll make the trip. I actually go in there in a couple of weeks. So good, cool. That's a good idea. Nice. So thank you. So, um, all right. Well, thank you, Michael, for uh, coming over to the channel. It's appreciated. Everybody in the chat. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Also, leave a comment. I love reading those. And remember, nothing in life gives you a right to be an asshole. Take care.